So our third presenter in this really, really interesting lineup um, will be going a little bit more to Europe here. We have Alessandra McGreen, and she is a she's completing her PhD in American history at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, which is the center of many things. I'd never anticipated that, and I've always loved, I'm sorry, it's so patronizing, or matronizing, but I love Scottish accents, and it's just a delight to know that we're going to learn so much about Buffalo Bill from Scottish accents and Scottish acculturation, for all I know. So, uh, so, that's, so that is where she is studying. She's an associate editor on the issue of a uh, t topic of Italian tours of the papers of W.F. Cody. Her article, Rough Riders in the Cradle of Civilization, Buffalo, Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show in Italy, and the challenge uh, takes up the study of the Wild West Show in Italy, and also the challenge of American cultural scarcity at the, at the end of the century. Uh, she, that's recently been published in the European Journal of American Culture. So this is an area, uh, such a curious and interesting way in which Americans get to see themselves refracted back, and then sometimes in ways that we are uh, instructed by, and sometimes unsettled by, and, and always edified by. So, Alessandra, thank you so much. for the introduction and uh, I would like to thank uh, sorry you can you hear me okay yeah great okay uh, thank you for the introduction Patricia I would like to thank um, um, the people from the papers project Jeremy Johnston Frank uh, Christensen Doug uh, and and uh, and the people from the, the center of the West Linda Sam uh, thank you so much for for uh, getting me here today and for the help that uh, uh, you have provided throughout the PhD. I'm really grateful for it. Okay. Um, um, so I would like to start this presentation today with uh, a quote from uh, Joey Cassin, uh, from uh, from uh, author of the book. Uh, of the study uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West Celebrity uh, Memory and Popular History. Um, uh, Kasson concludes her book by asserting that, quote, the marks of Buffalo Bill's Wild West are everywhere on the film Western, uh, end of quote. Um, and I think it's really hard to find someone who uh, would disagree with this uh, statement. I, I certainly agree. In fact, um, what my research on the impact of Cody's Wild West show in Italy has led me to believe is that Buffalo Bill's legacy goes far beyond the borders of classic American westerns. Um, I believe it has deeply involved the film industries of, of, all the other European, of all the European countries that back at the turn of the 20th century were touched by his show. This is especially true in the case of Italy, where the figure and, and even just the name of Buffalo Bill have represented a lasting and prosperous, so prosperous source of inspiration for the Italian cinema industry since the very beginning of its history. It was in fact the year 1906 when Cody, a scouting pioneer and initiator of mass entertainment, was approached by uh, Filoteo Alberini, the pioneer of Italian cinema. And allow me um, a brief digression on Alberini's life because his story is, is of paramount importance in the history of Italian cinema, but, but yet it's, it is not widely known. Um, and, and it's mostly because of the inaccessibility of his archival heritage, and about 90% of which is officially considered lost. Although in the last decade, um, snippets of his work um, have, have begun to resurface from, from oblivion. So Alberini, um, was born in central Italy in 1867, and his fascination for cinema stemmed, as, as it was only um, logical for, 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 that, for that era, um, it stemmed from an early interest in photography. And this passion led, uh, led him to um, work as a photographer, first for the Geographical Military Institute of Florence, and then in the land uh, registry office of the same town, where he was given the time and the means to experiment with new frontiers of photography. In 1894, after spotting and trying out a model of Edison's kinetoscope in a shop in Florence, he began to work on his own machine, which he called 
um, the kinetographer, and it's this. This is the, the, I mean, the machine is that one that you've just seen, but this is how it, it works, basically. The kinetographer was different from Edison machine, which was, um, many of you probably are, are my, my some of you might be uh, acquainted. It was, it's a, it's a wooden box uh, with the film and a light, and you look inside the, 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 the box, there is a lens, and you see the moving picture. Alberini's machine could not only do that in, in already in 1894, but that machine could um, had a lamp and could already project the image outside. So you didn't have to look into the box. Um, so um, um, yeah, so the, the process of, desi of design of this machine lasted about two months. And according to Alberini, and mm, the prototype was ready by December 1894, only a few months before the Lumiere brother copyrighted their own cinematograph in February 1895. But owing to the proverbial sloppiness of the Italian bureaucracy, which despite the new state um, still being in its early days, had already reached gargantuan dimension. Alberini did not manage to obtain the copyright for his own machine until late 1895. But the French cinema historian Georges Sadoul confirms um, this in his seminal uh, 1948 book, Le Pionnier du Cinéma. He says that Alberini had been one of the pioneers of the invention of the cinema in Italy. He copyrighted in 1894, before the first Lumière show in the Grand Café, a kinetographer, to a machine to visualize, visualize and project the films. He had also in 1904, managed um, in Rome, one of the first cinema halls called uh, Cinema Moderno, modern cinema. So uh, when in March 1906, Buffalo Bill arrived in the Eternal City in Rome for the second time, hoping to repeat the tremendous success the Wild West Show had achieved there 16 years before, Alberini was impatiently waiting for him, as was pretty much everyone else in Rome, given that the show's advertisement had appeared in the Italian press since January. We know for sure that Thomas Edison had been the first to immortalize on film some of the Wild West Show's acts in 1894, 1898, and 1902, as it is testified by um, these um, images from the, uh, that come from the Oklahoma Historical Society. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, so um, um, there is no doubt uh, the Alberini, who was actively engaged in the profession and kept continuously up to date by reading specialized publications and participating in expositions around Europe, was aware of these um, films uh, that were, were shot with Buffalo Bill. And um, he decided to make use of the opportunity of Buffalo Bill's Roman visit to, arise, to realize his own version of, of, of these films. Um, so accordingly to a 1907 cinema catalogue, um, Alberini's cinema company had to pay a fee of 25,000 liras, which is about the equivalent of $300,000 of today, in order to secure the exclusive access um, and property of the rights for the shoot. Rome's most impor important newspaper, Il Messaggero, confirms this on the 25th of March, 1906. Alberini filmed, quote, the interesting operation of arrival of Buffalo Bills Wild West, end of quote, which included the entrance of the company's trains into Rome Station and the process of encampment of the show. During the week-long Roman stay of the Wild West, Alberini also filmed the show's performance, performance in its entirety. The footage was screened right away in Alberini's Roman Cinema Theater, where the audiences, quote, wholly appreciate, appreciated the spectacle and recognized among the crowds renowned citizens and familiar faces and delighted themselves in, in identifying them aloud, especially those who were sitting in the gallery, end of quote. Two motion pictures initially entitled The Arrival of Buffalo Bill in Rome and then the complete performance of Buffalo Bill in Rome were subsequently joined together and released all over Italy with the title Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Unfortunately, as I was saying, while Edison's footages of the Wild West have been preserved, restored, and are now widely available, 
This was not the case with Alberini's. Despite searching far and wide in cinema archives in Rome and other filmic archives in Italy, the answer I've received from curators and silent cinema scholars has always been the same. Out of the 227 motion pictures that Alberini shot during his lifetime, only fragments of one have survived, which is La Presa di Roma. Uh, everything else is considered a lot. And I would like to point out that this one uh, film that was, um, was uh, retrieved came out of the cavo of a, of a Freemasonry lodge. And I would like to point out also, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'll point it out, but leave it there, otherwise there could be a big digression. Um, I, would <laughs> I would like to point out that both Cody and Alberini were Freemasons. Um, anyway, the films of Alberini undoubtedly amplified the impact that Cody's show exerted on Italian popular culture, as did the Buffalo Bill dime novels published by Milan's uh, Casa Editrice Americana since 1890, um, which you will find on your left. And in particular, the Western adventure novels written by Verona author Emilio Salgari on the right, uh, which often featured uh, Buffalo Bill among the main characters. It may be added also that Salgari's novelistic version of Buffalo Bill and other Western heroes appear to have greatly influenced the vision of directors like Sergio Leone and Sergio Solima, who before embarking on the actual spaghetti, spaghetti Western experience, began their careers as assistant director and screenwriters for TV adaptations of Salgari's short stories. In the case of Leone, though, the passion for the Western genre evidently ran in the family, as both his mother and father respectively starred and directed the 1913 silent picture, La Vampira Indiana, the, in the Indian vampiress. Regarded by cinema critics as the first proto-Western made in Italy, the film syncretically blended together two genres, the Western and the supernatural femme fatale, which now we might think they've got nothing to do with one another, but back then, evidently they proved a good marketing combination as both strands were very popular at the time. The success of Buffalo Bill's Wild West in Italy and of Alberini's eponymous footage indicated that also Cody's own films, where he enacted his standard role as a plains hero, would find an eager foreign market where they would be circulated throughout the 1910s. The imprint of Buffalo Bill on the Italian cinema industry therefore reached the point where even cinema halls were named after him. As in the case of Trieste's cinematographer Buffalo Bill, which of which the facade still survived. You can see all the sets and hats and that's supposed to be Buffalo Bill's face. Um, so cinema halls were named after him. And, uh, and I believe that the impact of Cody's Wild West show created in Italy a new segment of the entertainment market, which was not simply that of the Western genre, which already existed since the, actually since the advent of Cooper's novels in Italy. But I believe there was um, a share of the popular culture um, market devoted exclusively to the figure of Buffalo Bill, which found in cinema a core channel through which to reach consumers. So as noted by distinguished scholar Christopher Fla Frailing, between 1917, which is obviously the years of Cody's death, and 1920, three episodes of a silent serial called Buffalo and Bill uh, were directed and released in Italy by a company from Turin. Also in 1922 appeared the film La Reginetta dei Butteri, the Queen of the Butteri, by an obscure um, uh, director called Andrea, Unce Andrea Uccellini, which echoed the deeds of the Butteri, the Italian herdsmen who rose to the status of folk icons after they were invited to, s uh, to ride Buffalo Bill's Broncos during the 1890 Wild West show. So films about Buffalo Bill did not even stop um, w even when, in when the fascist regime rose to power, though for a few years there's no record of Italian productions. Yet foreign imports of Westerns continued to feature in Italian movie theaters until the, star the start of World War II. And what is interesting to note is that their original title was often altered in, or in order to include the two magic words, Buffalo Bill. It is the case 
of Cecil DeMille, The Plainsman, um, 1936, which appeared as Buffalo Bill in Italy. And then, and then uh, after the war, we've got uh, this other movie, uh, The Prairie, by a German director called Frank Wisbar from 1948. In Italy, it was released as Nella Terra di Buffalo Bill, in Buffalo Bill's land. So we've got, a, again, another example. Uh, Ray Taylor's Son of Billy the Kid, 1949, which was translated in Italy as Billy the Left-Handed, and whose promotional poster, as you can see, um, unfailingly displayed the statement, Billy the Kid, a legendary name as that of Buffalo Bill and Kit Carson. So the name of Buffalo Bill literally became a brand, a marketing device that was often used and abused. We see, in fact, how the letter of a puzzled cinema goer to a, cinema, to, to a, to a, cin to a film magazine points out the, the gap between the title of the film Buffalo Bill, Cecile de Mills, The Plainsman, uh, which was called Buffalo Bill in Italy, and the real subject of the movie, Wild Bill Hickok. The film journalist, although admitted to a case of deceitful propaganda, candidly responded, you know, it's because Buffalo Bill holds a better value in advertisement. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the commercial value of the name Buffalo Bill was recognized also by debutante director Giuseppe Acatino, who in 1949 wrote, produced, and directed the film Buffalo Bill a Roma, Buffalo Bill in Rome, which once again represented in highly nationalistic tones the Bronco, sadly, the Bronco saddling challenge between American cowboys and Italian butteri, which took place in 1890 Rome. Unfortunately, it appears that the film was so poorly made that even the safe, okay, even the safe heaven which the label Buffalo Bill offered could not spare the director from the utter financial and reputational collapse. Uh, I'll let you read this quote. Uh, you know, uh, and I'll carry on because I don't have uh, that much time left. So with the, with the end of the war, there was an astonishing number of American films arriving in Italy and heavily influencing audiences throughout the, 1950, throughout the 1950s. The impact of Westerns is very significant um, given the uh, Western adaptations that Italian directors would release between 1960s and 70s. Statistics tell us that in 1961 there were only three Westerns made in Italy, one in 62 and five in 63, and suddenly in 64 as many as 32 such films were recorded. And in s from 68 onwards for a decade, there was an, an annual average of Italian Westerns, um, um, 73 each year. 73 spaghetti western each year. So um, it's precisely in 64 that, um, I don't have time to show the clip, but um, there was this um, first uh, spaghetti western made by an Italian, uh, Mario Costa, which starred, uh, of course, which starred Buffalo Bill. It was played by Gorgon Scott, who um, was famous for playing Tarzan and Machiste. And uh, it didn't have a great reception, but what I think it's, it's interesting is that it was received better in America than it was in Italy, uh, which um, it's unusual for Spaghetti Western. Um, so um, to, to, to conclude, uh, I want to carry on to the, to the next section, which um, talks about the, um, after the blast of excitement surrounding the Western genre in Italian cinema uh, during the, the 70s, um, along came a renegotiation and an attitude of resistance and hostility towards the importation of American cultural products, an attitude which fits into the historical framework of countercultural contestation and which would foster um, Native American revisionism. So after the deluge of representation of the myth of the West in post-war popular culture, there came a backlash. The figure of Buffalo Bill, together with other myth mythical Western heroes such as General Custer went from a long phase of celebration into one of critique and parody. Marco Ferreri's uh, 1974 film Don't Touch the White Woman, which was a French-Italian production, seeks to do just that. Ferreri represents in satirical and grotesque, grotesque key a crucial moment of the, hi of the history of the West, which until then had been really represented in very serious and dramatic tones by US cinematography as well as historiography the massacre of Custer and his men at the Battle of Little Bighorn. 
Ferrari's desecrating irony lashes out with particular vehemence at the character of Buffalo Bill. As the man who had popularized and sanitized the myth of the Western expansion, recreating in his show Custer's Last Stand in the most melodramatic uh, style, almost, almost enveloped in an aura of sacredness. So, um, how much time have I got? Two minutes. So, um, I, don't, I don't think I have time to show you the, the clip, but um, far from uh, Buffalo Bill in this film is far from being the hero of the Wild West. Cody is vilified and pictured as a true sideshow freak. Um, he is a, um, a dull wimp with the illusion of grandeur who constantly attempts to steal the limelight from the equally egomaniac General Custer, who is played by Marcello Mastroianni, uh, uh, La Dolce Vita, you know? So from this, from the, I don't know why he went on to do Westerns after, after, play, uh, you know, after being Fellini's um, uh, you know, favorite actor, but never mind. Uh, for, for this reason, uh, you know, uh, um, the key inter of the interpretation of the film is a bouleversement. The West um, is uh, restaged in the dig of a building uh, in the center of Paris. Uh, and then the transcontinental railroad uh, is an allegory of the shopping mall uh, Forme de Leal, the construction of which had required the demolition of the historical medieval quarter, quarter of Leal de Paris. The Indians become the evicted resident of the old neighborhood who unwillingly, uh, unwilling to surrender to progress, decide to retaliate. Ferrari's, Ferrari's criticism envisions the West as the deceitful creational myth of America and stretches his condemnation to embrace the effects of Americanization and global capitalism. Just briefly to conclude, uh, in these pictures, we see how the figure of Buffalo Bill has influenced the reception of the myth of the West and of American culture in Italy throughout the 20th century and the ways in which ci um, cinema has voiced this fascination. Italian directors have welcomed Cody's vision with wonder and enthusiasm, quickly moving from emulation to appropriation of his meta-narrative and aesthetics, finally to repossess them for their own artistic, commercial, and political needs. All this goes to show the resilience of the character and of the endeavor of Buffalo Bill, which has proven to be not only transnational, but, only, but, but also transcultural and transmedial, having managed to permeate a multitude of aspects of pro popular culture and of the communication industry around the globe. Thank you. Okay, we're uh, ready for the house lights, and then if you could come perch, I think the word would be perch along the edge there, and we, are, uh, we have our microphones in deployment. Is that right? We are about to have our, there come our microphones. We are ready to roll, which sounds like we're going to film, well, we're already filming, so, but like we're, uh, don't think of any of those scary things on the screen as we do this. This is a different kind of production. So, uh, questions? Yes. Thank you all for such wonderful talks. Uh, my question is for Alessandra. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the reception of these films in Italy and uh, what, whether there were kind of newspaper reviews and how those might help us to understand how people may have appropriated ideas of the West for their own cultural concerns in the period. And then I was also curious, selfishly, if any of the um, films in, the, in Italy are ever filtered through the kind of Western cinema in France um, through people like Jean Durand, who are making French films in the south of France in the Camargue um, from 1906 forward. Yeah, I'll, start, I'll start answering the second question, and my answer is, I'm sorry, I don't know, because I, um, this is the very last part of my research, and I've just uh, come, basically I've, you know, I've just discovered um, that West it Westerns were being made and produced in Italy, also in the silent era. Um, I know there were, um, I know there was, um, there were uh, sort of proto-Westerns during the war and in the f early 50s, but uh, um, only through the discovery of Alberini's work, then I found out 
uh, of this whole, um, um, uh, you know, and there, there are quite a few throughout the 1910s. Um, uh, in 1913, there is one called uh, Sulla Via del Loro, uh, on, uh, which I think came out in, uh, um, it was, as far as I, I'm aware, it wasn't circulated in France. It was circulated in, in, in the UK and in America, and it came out as uh, the Human Bridge. It was about the gold rush. Um, and sorry, what, what is the other question? Oh, the reception of these films. Um, it was, uh, they were very popular. Uh, they were very popular uh, and um, among young people, but among also people of an older generation. And my contention is because it reminded them of Cody's show. And that's why Cody is, is such an important uh, character in all, in, in all this. And um, for, for what concerns um, the, the spaghetti westerns, so later on, uh, they, uh, they had a huge success. And most of them were, were mostly popular uh, starting in Italy. You know, that popularity began in Italy. In America, they were, by critics, they were disparaged mainly. But then, but then people in America uh, liked them. Um, but uh, um, there, you know, the the the, the, crit the critical reevaluation of the spaghetti western kind of came later on. I don't know if I answered to uh, if that's what you were expecting, but thank you. Uh, yes, please. Can I ask a question that goes across all? Uh, three um, presenters. Uh, it's clear um, that in the different uh, contexts, uh, whether it's within Africa, whether it's in relation to representations and misrepresentations of various North African and Middle Eastern uh, identities uh, in the United States, or whether it's in relation to the appropriation of various aspects uh, of Western American culture as perceived through the Italian lens that people um, are making their own meanings from uh, what they are actively reading into. Um, the phenomenon of Buffalo Bill, uh, and I would suggest quite specifically um, leaving aside the historical person, the phenomenon of Buffalo Bill's Wild West uh, as a representation. So uh, my question um, uh, to all three um, is, uh, what do you see? Um, obviously, you've been limited to 20 minutes and giving us an insight into some of these snippets. Um, what do you see as being the most important thing that you had to leave out because of the limitations of time? question of every speaker's dreams. That's really like, <laughs> man, a crit. Wow, I want you in every audience. That's wonderful. So. Well, okay. There's two things that I left out. Um, I mean, there's many things that I left out. Um, but in my expanded um, article on this, I venture a little far afield from um, Buffalo Bill and look at um, the way in which these um, Arab shows or these Arab acrobatic troops performed um, along shows where there was minstrelsy and blackface and looking um, at not only the this juxtaposition of Native Americans and Arab performers in the Wild West show, but also the, the juxtaposition, but also the real distinction between Arab performers um, and these blackface and minstrel shows and also this long tradition. I mean, the author of the Uncle Remus stories had a series of stories about children encountering like an Arab that they first thought was an enslaved person and uh, blah, 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 turns out to be like an oriental fantasy. It was a bilis, uh, in her youth and she, was, she would tell me tons of different stories. One story she told me is that what they would do is that with her gang, they would barge into a, a bar dancing and just commandeer the bar dancing and, and kick out the, the, the man, the male patrons who had their 
girls with them and they would dance with the girls. You know, and they would put their boots in on the table, you know, to be served, of course, uh, free of charge. And, and then I was silly, of course, and I asked her, so did you dance with the girls or the man, you know? She said, of course I danced with the girls. I couldn't dance with the man because I was a cowboy. I was a, I was a Dill. I was a Dilles. I wasn't a woman. I was, I was a Dill, you know? So she was a tough person. So she would dance with the girls and not with the with the guys, which was really interesting. But if you see her, she's you know, pretty feminine, very elegant, and very coquette, and so on, you know. But she was telling me that uh, during the days, you know, she would have her dress and conform to kind of the gender identity that uh, people try, adults try to enforce in Kinshasa. But at night, she would don, you know, she would get rid of the dress and dress up in, uh, in, in cowboy gear and really have this masculine and male identity because the movement was really about masculinity, about manhood, and about manliness. So that was one big part that I had to leave out. <laughs> but it's in the book, right? <laughs> Um, basically, I've left out a lot because this is just the last fragment of, the, of my PhD uh, thesis. Uh, I think the most important part of, of my research has, has got to do with the, um, with the interpretation of, of, the, of, what goes of, of the reception, what goes on during the, um, the sh uh, you know, the, what goes on in, in, in Italian society during the show. Um, especially going back to that theme of anxiety, which we discussed a couple of days ago. Uh, it, it's interesting to note that uh, when Cody arrived in Italy with the show, um, the, he, st he stirred some sort of uh, uh, culture war between America's newfangled culture and, and Italy's uh, ancient culture, who was uh, still uh, trying to um, filter through uh, the new political uh, the new political situation which wasn't very uh, very um, happy uh, you know, positive so yeah, anyway it's in my thesis when, you know once it's finished you'll you'll all read it <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen we are uh, uh, out of time, I did have a very cool question I wanted to ask if you guys, as a threesome, if you were to convene the people who in some way or another had identities inherited from this relationship. So we would have the, uh, the folks who are now older but who were kids and who took this identity and we'd have the people who were thinking, oh, I had an ancestor and he was in the Arab uh, exhibits in the and, and people to whom spaghetti westerns were sort of their point of orientation. So what would, if we got a little conference of those people together, could the three of you convene them into a sense of common heritage through Buffalo Bill? And the answer, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So <laughs> I could just leave that hanging. But I have a little ritual here that I've, I'm going to perform now, if I might. I'll just take a minute here. So I am uh, not retiring, not fading away, but I did go out into the world in the uh, late 1980s talking about the Renaissance in Western American history and the studies of that. I went everywhere and said that there was a Renaissance. I didn't know if there was going to be one or not. So it's a precarious thing to say, oh, the field of Western American studies, full of vitality, unexpected angles. Uh, it would have been very embarrassing and very awkward if that hadn't happened. <laughs> so it did happen. So again, I'm not retiring. Uh, or four years maybe. So these are the cutest little things. These are pencils that are shaped like batons, little like drum major batons. And so this is my little ritual. You have to be careful because the eraser tops fall off very easily. So this is my ritual with younger people who are doing really cool things with varying on Western American history of passing on the baton. So so this is my form of appreciation for a great panel. Your baton? Yes, yes, yes. of saying this is a great panel and there have been many other fine presentations that also redeemed my honor from those prophecies and so in fact that person is going to get a baton and Laura I mean all kinds of people so if you you know who you are and it's a good share of you here I have more batons <laughs>